seven years old. Absolutely amazing. Thank you, Mia. So what is the gift of atheism? The trajectory of humanity seems to be one of decreasing exclusivity. I know that might seem strange in our current political climate. But early humans saw anyone outside of their immediate tribe as a threat and to be feared, possibly killed. Over time, to see ever more diverse groups as a part of our people is increasing. For thousands of years, one of the ways people othered others was by identifying them by their religious grouping. Non-theism is a living example that people can shine with goodness, whether they adhere to a religious group or not. They are good, not because of fear of retribution from the myth of a judgmental God but because it is natural and right to be compassionate and just. Let us come together with the song, Love Will Guide Us. In honor of Mother's Day. On this day when we honor mothers, we honor mothers who have just become mothers. Mothers who doze with a sleeping baby on their chest. Mothers who wipe snotty noses and tears. Mothers who fight with their children over screen time, battling it out against the pool of social media daily. Mothers who read aloud to their brood, bathed and smelling sweet and sleepy. Mothers who try to do it all, work, house, partner, exercise, children, baking cookies for the whole class, being good, helping the planet. Oh my Lord, it's so exhausting. Mothers who say, enough and lie on the sofa with their feet up, only to be leapt on by everyone. <laughs> Mothers who hide in the bathroom for a few minutes of quiet. Mothers who are afraid because their teen is out too often, won't speak to anyone over 18, and is learning to drive. Mothers who are grateful for a loving conversation with a young adult, emerging from the angst of youth into gratitude and confidence. Mothers whose adult children are struggling 
and you so want to fix it. Mothers who have lost their child to death, to drugs, to despair. And mothers whose adult children are just thriving. Whether your mother is alive, has passed on, or is in the twilight of dementia, hold her in your gratitude, for it was in her womb that your life began and she became a mother. Let us light this chalice. Welcome, everyone. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. Thank you, Miran. Welcome to everyone. And in particular, we would like to warmly welcome anyone who might be new to our congregation or nearly new. Is there anyone amongst us who would like to introduce themselves? I already introduced Mia, Mia She. We are the North Shore Unitarian Church. And in this community, we celebrate people from all walks of life, no matter how you make your living or how you experience the sacred, no matter who you are or whom you love. You are welcome here. I would like to introduce Mehran, who lit our chalice this morning. Mehran sometime in a dark and rainy September night, I think it was, was running past our church, and he saw lights on. And being the curious soul that he is, he ran down here, and the door was open. I think it was Barry who came and welcomed him. He popped in his head, and he sat with us, and he has been part of this choir and congregation ever since. He comes from Iran, has been here for almost a year. Yes, and was here with family. He's heading back to Iran at the end of May, but does hope to return at some point. The candle of joys and sorrows. The way I've done this quite consistently this year has been to ask anyone here if there is anyone in particular, who's close to your heart. It might be a joy, it might be a sorrow, it might be a concern. Are there any names that you would like to call out? And as you do that, Miran and Sue will light a candle for each one of them. Is there anyone who would like us to hold in our thoughts? Janelle. Janelle, yes. Lynn Webster. Virginia. Sorry? Virginia. Virginia. Uh, Virginia. Robin. Yes. Penny. And Richard. Chris. Ian. Mary Ann. J. Anyone else who is dear to us? Wendy. Wendy, that we would like to hold in our love at this time. Okay. Please take a deep breath. You may close your eyes if you so choose. At this time, we open our hearts, we extend our love to those whom we might not even know, and yet they are part of our world of love and care. We hold healing love for Janelle, 
for Lynn Webster, for Virginia, for Robin, for Penny and Richard. We hold love for Chris, for Ian, Mary Ann, for Jay, and for Wendy. Our love reaches out like the light of our world, enwrapping them in care, concern, and healing. May it be so. Amen. The choir will now sing Ubi Caritas. Universalist hymn book, which was published in 1964, had the word God in 40.3% of its 132 hymns. The UU hymn book, which was published in 1993, had the word God in 25.3% of its 415 hymns. Our Teal Supplement, which was published in 2005, had the word God in 17.5% of its 17, hang on, of its 74 hymns. You see the trend. Hymn books are meant to reflect the changing theology of its denomination. Some of the concepts dispensed with by the editors of the 1964 hymn book was, or were, that we come into the world as sinners and need to be redeemed by Jesus' saving grace. 
that God has a predetermined path for each of us which we must attempt to discern and follow. That God chooses who will live and die, how they will live and die, and we are passive players in this drama, good Calvinistic theology. That prayer is us asking God to fix things, whether what we want to happen comes about or not, is determined then by the quality of also of our prayer and or God's will. These are only a very few examples from the myriad of religious myths which we as a people have inherited from centuries, if not thousands of years, of humans trying to understand and control our place in this world. Over the 20 wonderful years of working for this church and denomination, I have evolved in my thinking about how I think about God. When I started, Reverend Linda Horton Weaver was the minister, and bless her. Oh, she was so gracious and patient with me, as were all of you. I totally did not even see the religious assumptions I was making in my choices of both choral repertoire and hymns. I did not recognize a theological stance of worshiping a God above, waiting for his word to enlighten me. I was utterly blind to my own biases. It was only with patient guidance and tolerance from I think now 10 ministers that I've come to be a little more aware of what I'm asking you to sing. I thank you all for your patience. The move in both UU congregations and in our wider society towards agnosticism has been unequivocal, and I will explore this throughout this sermon. But first, a few definitions. Today, I will speak about agnosticism, atheism, mysticism, theism, humanitarianism, both religious and secular. So I'm going to take a moment to very briefly define these terms. And you all have a pen and piece of paper with you, I believe. So as I go over these terms, please see if you can identify yourselves. You might not need to write this down. It's perfectly possible to be more than one, by the way. A theist is someone who does have a belief in a supernatural entity, a being that exists independently of humans. Under the umbrella of theism is Christianity, Islam, Judaism, some types of Buddhism, Hinduism, and many other religions. That's theism. Atheism. Atheism, in its simplest definition, refers to the absence of belief in gods or supernatural beings. Atheists do not affirm the existence of God due to a lack of convincing evidence or arguments. Therefore, an atheist might say, I choose to believe only what can be proven in this world scientifically. Therefore, I can categorically say there is no God. That's atheism. Agnosticism. Agnostics assert that the existence of gods or supernatural entities are unknown, inherently unknowable, or beyond the realm of empirical evidence and rational inquiry. Therefore, someone who considers herself to be an agnostic might say, I am 99.9% .9 certain that there is no supernatural god, but I can't say that categorically there is not one because I don't know everything. A mystic is an individual who seeks or believes they have experienced direct personal experience of the divine, a spiritual or transcendent reality. Mysticism is a spiritual practice or belief system that involves the pursuit of union with or absorption into the divine, often through contemplation, meditation, prayer, or other mystical experiences. 
Now, humanism is much broader in scope than these other terms that I've already gone over, which relate only to whether one does or does not believe in God. While common usage of the term today has, of humanist has come to refer to someone who does not believe in a supernatural being, this is actually inaccurate. According to my research, it is perfectly possible to be a humanist who is an atheist or a humanist who might even be a mystic. Humanism is a philosophical and ethical stance that places emphasis on the value, agency, and potential of human beings. It is a worldview that prioritizes human concerns, human values, and dignity, often without recourse to supernatural belief or, re or religious doctrines. Humanism emphasizes rational thinking, scientific inquiry, and critical analysis as means of understanding the world and solving human problems. Humanism is an ex inclusive and expansive worldview, and I suspect one that many of us here would embrace. It also has a spectrum from religious to secular humanism, and I would like to take a moment to define both here. Religious humanism is a philosophical and ethical stance that combines humanist principles with elements of religious or spiritual belief. Religious humanists typically share many of the same core values as secular humanists, such as a commitment to reason, science, human dignity, and social justice. However, they also integrate aspects of religious or spiritual tradition into their worldview, often emphasizing the moral teachings the community aspects and rituals of their respective religious or spiritual backgrounds. Secular humanism. Secular humanism is a philosophy that again emphasizes human reason, ethics, and the pursuit of human flourishing in the context of a secular framework. It rejects supernatural beliefs and religious dogma in favor of a rational and evidence-based understanding of the world. Secular humanism places human beings at the center of moral, ethical, and philosophical considerations, focusing on the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. Now, I would love to take a moment now to get a quick glimpse of how many people in this room align themselves with which category. And you can be more than one thing. So if you'd be willing, I'm gonna call out um, one, of the, one of the headings and just put up your hand. It's not that I'm specifically looking to you, it's partly because I'm part of the Sunday Service Committee and it's very helpful for us to get a sense of where this congregation align themselves. So, bearing in mind you can be more than one thing, would you categorize yourself as an agnostic? Thank you. Would you categorize yourself as an atheist? Would you categorize yourself as a theist, as a mystic? Ha! Huh. Well, <laughs> that was a surprise. Secular humanist? Oh, no, 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 not mine. Religious humanist? Thank you. That is really helpful to us as service planners. And yes, I am a mystic one of the few in this room, actually not that few. But for this service, I have met with, interviewed, and chosen to attempt to see from the perspective of some beloved secular or religious humanists amongst us. My interest in this subject has been with me for most of my life, with a mother who found comfort in faith and a father who is an adamant atheist. The task of my life has been to hold both and in the same space, seeking the essential essence of both points of view. And I have found in this community an opportunity to explore and celebrate the truths and goodness that lie within all deeply held convictions. 
So what have I learned from listening and learning from these people whom I love and respect so much? I should just say right now that I did have a Zoom meeting with five of this congregation. And they were Sue Forbes, Marsha Stevenson, Jim Stevenson, Brian McConnell, and John Biasucci, who's not with us today. Thank you so much. But I should also add that my learning has not only been from these people, but from all of you. So what have I learned? I have learned that the central force in your lives and this UU congregations is love. No, not Hollywood love, but hard-working agape love. Love that is will, intelligence, conscience, and compassion made manifest. It is the force of intelligent life manifesting itself daily in trying to discern which is the better choice and then do it. Let me be more specific. Unitarians throughout the ages have questioned religious assumptions and forged a new path forward. I believe that the movement of religious and secular humanism is doing just that. So I'm going to take a few religious assumptions and show how they have been reshaped by thinkers throughout history. So myth number one, that deep abiding sacred love and truth emits only from God and can be interpreted only by a religion. So what do I see emerging from non-theistic belief? I see that deep, abiding, and yes, sacred. And when I say sacred, I'm not meaning religious sacred. I'm meaning our deepest integrity, our deepest capacity as humans to bring about change through love. Sacred love and truth is common to all humanity. Number two, myth that the word of the Bible is God's word and finite and that the only sacred truth comes from the Bible. I see that the Bible is only one source of truth, that wisdom and truth is being revealed constantly, constantly. Each one of us has access to sacred truth. And again, I do not mean sacred specifically of God. I mean it of the deepest truth, the deepest right, and the deepest compassion. Myth three, that we humans are worthless unless a part of God's kingdom. I see that humans have an awesome and terrifying capacity for good and harm, that light shines within, between, and around us. Our capacity for healing each other and our planet home has never been greater. Myth four, that prayer is asking God to do something that we want. I see that prayer is not a passive request, but a turning of the power of our heart, our mind, and our soul. And again, I would say I don't mean soul as necessarily a part of God, but part of humanity, to engaging with and healing those whom we hold in light and love. So you might ask, well, what is church for if we dispensed with the idea of supernatural God, although not everyone has? It is for giving us a container in which we can intentionally increase our capacity for love. I'm gonna say that again. It is a container in which we can intentionally increase our capacity for love. Love such a small word, and yet such an extraordinary capacity. Love, that which truly binds us over land and time. Love, a vehicle for compassion. Love, that which manifests the will. 
love. That which reaches deep into confusion and hurt and can transform it into wellness. Love that gives us with the capacity to turn self-criticism into acceptance. Love that can transform our consumption of this planet into a cohabitation with this planet. Whether we believe that love comes from a supernatural God or is purely an extraordinary gift of evolution, it exists. And I believe we have barely scratched the surface of love, of how love could change us and the world for the better. Church is a physical space and an intentional collection of values and principles for doing just this. Let us use this extraordinary place to develop our capacity for love. It might be through meditation, exchanging ruminating self-obsession for calm self-knowing. It might be for the generous exchange of ideas in a discussion group, enlarging our worldview. It might be that when conflict happens as it does, and we, cho we choose to overcome our desire to protect ourselves or lash out with words, choosing instead a, a path of compassion and larger understanding. It might be for work in our society, supporting organizations to mitigate as best as can the ways which we damage each other and our planet. It may be in reaching out to support anyone who needs our help. When we do these acts, the angels sing. <laughs> Let us celebrate in singing the fire of commitment. From the light of days remembered, burnt a beacon bright and clear, guiding hands and hearts and spirits into faith set free from fear. Please be 
be seated. As I mentioned earlier, in preparation for this sermon, I had the honor of meeting with several of the members of this congregation. I asked them about their thoughts, feelings, about what gives their lives meaning and power. In this next few minutes, I invite you to use their thoughts as a springboard for your own observations about what brings meaning and power into your life. We'll take a few moments after each reading of silence for you to reflect and notice your thoughts. You have all been given paper and pen. You don't have to do this at all, but it can be useful. As I said, I will say something which comes from one of our congregation. I often find that words of wisdom coming from the pulpit can serve as a bouncing off point for your own ideas. If that feels important, write it down. From Sue Forbes. Be conscious and experiencing things. I'm so much more appreciative of what it is to just experience, whether it be love or beauty. I feel such an appreciation of what we can experience as a human being. It's a miracle. from Brian McConnell. If there is a kind of God thing in our lives, it is whatever is at the apex of the pyramid of our values. At the apex of the pyramid of our values. What gives my life meaning? It's whatever interactions that you have and the people you choose to be in interaction with. It's showing up for people. It's keeping learning. It's trying to contribute to make things a little better in whatever ways that you can. Some of my questions from Brian. How is it that you live your life? What are you consciously doing with your life? Life is so amazing. That should be enough. It's enough for me in any case. From Jim Stevenson. What are the consequences of my lack of belief? Do I behave badly? Do I have no experience of wonder and awe? Not at all. I find that I am hopelessly good for nothing. I find I really want to do the right thing. I can't help trying to practice honesty, fidelity, compassion, and generosity. I'm sorry. There's no good reason for it. As for wonder and awe, well, 
I experience that whenever I contemplate nature, beauty, music, evolution, consciousness, other weird science, the miracle of birth, laughter, anger, or a sunny day. from Marsha. It's feeling a connection to human beings through creative expression from places near and far away from where I am now, whether it's reading a poem that was written 500 years ago or a translation of an ancient text, whether it be listening to music or watching a live performance, interconnectivity through art, that transcends time and space. That to me is a spiritual experience. And then I would say the human connection with one other person or a small group. When you have that aha moment in conversation that together you've landed on something new that you all agree with, a shared comprehension that transcends our individual isolation. from John Biasucci. What gives my life meaning and purpose? It's appreciating what's here. If I reach out for anything, it's just a deeper awareness in the moment of the everyday, as opposed to looking for something beyond. It's more like intensifying my appreciation and awareness of what is here what makes this life worthwhile are those shining moments that I see happening while I'm still alive and here. Come to our time for the offering. The offering this, will, this week will be taken to support the work of the Wild, Wild Bird Trust of BC. This month's outreach recipient is the Wild Bird Trust of BC. The trust is responsible for Maplewood Flats, a protected sanctuary in North Vancouver for wild birds, as well as a centre for education and cultural programming. They're currently working on reconciliation measures with the Tuolumne Nation as they plan for their future. Kevin Bell, a longtime member of North Shore Unitarians, has been heavily involved in the development of the Wild Bird Trust prior to his death. Many of us enjoyed his extensive knowledge as we were fortunate to tour the flats with Kevin. Will the ushers please take the offering? Thank you. And the choir will sing I Ain't Afraid by Holly Near.
In gratitude for these gifts and for all that we do to weave this tapestry of love we call community, let us give thanks. Thank you. We have a few announcements today. The life of the church is active in many ways to nurture those within and outside of its community. Here are a few announcements. Huge gratitude for so many of you who are bringing uh, food and toiletries for the North Shore Women's Centre Emergency Supplies Programme. You are making a difference. Thank you. Please keep it up. It's so incredibly significant and makes a difference. Uh, there is coffee and tea served after the service. Is it going to be downstairs or upstairs? Does anyone know? It's up here. It's up here. Thank you, Annabelle. Uh, next week's service is a meditative and contemplative service. The pace of life can feel fast, overwhelming even. The ancient tradition of meditation is a time-honored practice to deepen our awareness of being in the present moment. It encourages us to pause and to connect with our inner wisdom and learn or relearn to listen with compassion to ourselves and others. Let's prepare to leave this place with the singing of Love Calls Us On. And could the choir please come up? Thank you. Thank you. 
Yes, please be seated, choir. There are those among us who yearn still to be anchored by the threat, thread of mystery, who yearn to experience the ineffable, and who thrum to the call of a faith unknown. And there are those among us for whom the golden light of curiosity in a child's light eyes is enough, or the sun dancing upon the waves holding all the wonders of our world. Let humility and care guide us as we come together on Sunday mornings and live our lives during the week. Let us know that our deepest knowing is one life lived among billions. Each is precious, each worthwhile. Let us be grateful that we can be seen in this community where all are embraced and all belong. As you go out into the world, take with you the warmth of this place. Share a smile, a gesture. Let your eyes look gently upon those whom you are with this week and let their name be safe in your mouth. Amen. Let us join together singing Circle Round for Freedom. <laughs> 